it's lovely to welcome you to Hesket Media, to our podcast channel, and this is also going to be recorded, and we put it onto YouTube, In Conversation. I think it's now episode 33, if I'm not mistaken, of In Conversations with our, our speakers. So, welcome. Thanks, Duncan. It's an absolute pleasure to be joining you. As I said earlier, just before we edited all that out, um, we're just going to have a, a lovely chat, get to know who you are, um, not just as a speaker, but who, what made you go into speaking and just general questions around there. So let's start and say, introduce yourself. I, I, can, oh. <laughs> I can read something, but I think it's much better that you tell us who you are. Cool. So um, my name is Nziki Mkize, and I, oftentimes when I speak, um, depending where I am and who I'm speaking to, people kind of look at me twice and go, oh, that's <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> um, so Nziki is said like Nikki, just with the T-S. So Nikki Nziki, and that is how you say my name. Um, and I am a speaker with um, Hexeth Media. Um, I run a business called Mentor, which is focused on creating a global mentorship network supporting female social entrepreneurs. And that's really my passion. So um, I self-published a book a few years ago called, two years ago, called My Hall of Mentors. And it was really just a reflection of different lessons that I had learned from my mentors and wanted to share with other people, um, specifically because it was around the time that um, I had done Miss South Africa and I was Miss South Africa's second princess for 2015. And I had a lot of young people asking me about how do you become successful, right? And they kind of almost asked the question with this assumption that I just woke up and everything was fine. So I was like, no, actually, what have I learned? Who did I learn it from? Um, and, I, and I compiled those into a book. And then last year, I had the wonderful privilege of completing my master's in social innovation. So mentor for me was that combination between mentorship and also making sure that we can support more women in creating impact businesses or to transition from um, running a nonprofit and create some kind of sustainability in the work that they do. So that's our, that's the business. And we have a magazine that we've launched as well. Um, but with that, then I also do coaching and training and facilitating around the topics of um, social entrepreneurship and impact, social innovation. Um, I do work on resilience and I'm also resilience up certified practitioner as well as a five lane certified um, practitioner. So I do lots of coaching and training and facilitation for organizations around um, resilience and the Enneagram, you know, so that's very, very much me on a corporate working, <laughs> corporate working <laughs> side. <laughs> I think that's quite an impressive CV just from the start. Um, so if we, go, if we take a few steps back, what made you go into Miss South Africa then? I mean, you know, growing up, what did you want to be? Yeah. So growing up, no lie, Duncan, I wanted to be the president. I right? think for the longest time, I was like, I'm going to be the president because not because I wanted to be a president, right? But I really admired um, leaders like Nelson Mandela. And I was like, oh, you fix the world by being a president, right? You have power, you have influence, you can make decisions, you become president. That's what you do. Um, and I, I researched Nelson Mandela's career and I was like, oh, he was a lawyer. So that's what I have to do. I'm going to go study law and then I'll become the president. And then I think when I was in high school, I joined the debate team and around grade 10, one of the metrics we were on the debate team with was like super aggressive. Um, and I was just like, whoa, this is very like not great energy. And in my mind, I just correlated that to parliament. And I was like, wait, if I am a president, then I have to deal with this stuff in parliament and I'm not interested at all. Um, and then when I started looking to it, I was like, what I actually care about is the impact and the change and the difference. Um, and you can do that by doing a lot of things. And around that era, you know, philanthropy was sort of like a growing thing. Every other celebrity or a famous entrepreneur was a philanthropist. And I was like, oh, I think I'm going to be a philanthropist. And I suppose the research on how do you become a philanthropist is you run a successful business or you become famous. Um, I can't sing. I definitely don't think I can act. And so the next best thing to that was um, becoming a TV personality um, through a platform like Miss South Africa, right? Uh, because, you know, Tyra Banks had a show, Oprah had a show, and that was kind of like their journey. Um, but looking at the platform of Missile Africa itself is apart from, you know, the opportunity to be on stage and that has whatever um, impact it has, is that you have so many fantastic sponsors that are part of that program. So if you have a really great um, passion purpose project that you're working on, you then all of a sudden get all the support behind it. Uh, and that's a really great stepping stone. So I had in my mind that, you know, if I become Miss South Africa, I can firstly use that platform um, to elevate entrepreneurship and mentorship for young women. But then secondly, um, I could you know, transition that into a TV career and then I'll become a philanthropist. <laughs> so then growing up, I mean, you mentioned Nelson Mandela there. Apart from him, who, who inspired you to be, to be the person you wanted to be? 
Yes, I think famous people are definitely Oprah Winfrey. Um, but from a more personal level, my strongest, my most cherished lesson, lessons that I still hold on to today is from my parents and my grandmother. And I say specifically more my grandmother because uh, my grandmother was born in 1928, if I'm not mistaken. And for the majority of her life, she was a single mom to over the period of her life, she had 12 children. By the time I was born, she only had six left. Um, and she was a domestic worker most of her life or had also worked in a salt factory. And I just always looked at my grand's life and the, the experiences that she had and juxtaposed that with the experiences I was having, right? Um, and kind of the deep conversations we would have around, you know, I would ask her her opinion on the world and her feelings on the world, you know, so here I am and I'm dying to see the world and I want to travel. And I would ask my grand, I was like, don't you want to go somewhere? And she'd always say to me, like, I have no business going anywhere in the world, like I'm happy where I am. And I always found her ability to just be so resolute with where she was, who she was, um, very interesting, you know. Uh, we would talk about people and the quality of people and, you know, human life and things like that. And for her, for her being somebody who grew up during apartheid and me being a young person, you know, going to school where, some of my best friends were white. It was also a very interesting conversation, just hearing her view on the world, you know. Um, I think a lot of the good lessons that I've learned in life and that I still apply still to this day come from my grandmother. I think um, we can all look back fondly. And isn't that what grandmothers also are supposed to be? Yeah. You know, they they strict on their own children, but with the grandchildren, they can give them all the chocolates <laughs> and let them stay up late. <laughs> <laughs> very, very, very sweet gestures. I always loved, even just the, you know, the transaction of like, I suppose time changes. So I remember we'd visit my grand and then she'd like slip us 20 rand and she's like, pour yourself petrol, you know. And 20 rand isn't a lot of money to pour petrol, but like in her mind, like 20 rand was still like a lot of value. And it was always going, oh, Coco, um, Things don't cost that much anymore. I just, I don't know if you've caught up on inflation, but <laughs> it was always a gesture and the, the heart and the thought behind it rather than, you know, the actual act itself. Oh, definitely. I mean, I saw that with my mother. So my kids would go there and I was never allowed chocolates or sweets growing up. Not yeah. one. And then they'd go there and she'd have a tin at the front door. And as they walked in, she'd be like, you never did that with me. <laughs> so, <Nope. laughs> Favoritism. <laughs> So if you could choose three people to have at your dinner table, anyone, alive, dead, doesn't matter, who would they be? Sure, that's a question I wish I was prepared for. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, sure, that's so interesting. So I will definitely go according to my faith. So I would definitely have Jesus at the table just because I've got so many questions I need to ask and clarify. I'm like, listen, let's talk about this because <laughs> I think it's a mess a little bit right now, you know? Um, <laughs> and I think, um, I think most recently, definitely um, Sir Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. And she was, she was the first female democratically elected president in Africa. And she was the, she's formerly the president of Liberia. Um, and I think just woman leadership in that context for me is very interesting. So having somebody like her at a table where I could ask her questions about, you know, really the reality of her lived experience, um, but also how do you navigate those kinds of spaces and practical steps going forward, you know, um, just in the world. Um, and then probably somebody like Rihanna, because <laughs> I think she's just fun. <laughs> I think she just would be like a lively person to have at a dinner table and just like call you out on your nonsense. And like, <laughs> just the kind of friend that's like, girl, no, we're not doing that. So <laughs> I, I, I definitely have someone like her at the table. That would be quite an interesting mix between her and yeah. Jesus. <laughs> she may not be I, so lively. <laughs> I think we'll all have a good conversation. <laughs> I do think so. So, you know, progressing, and I, I know uh, you've got your book and we've spoken about the publication and you're going to be bringing that out. So you can tell us a little bit about it just now. But what do you enjoy most about what you're doing now? So whether it be facilitating or speaking, what is it that really gets you up in the morning and goes, I love my job? What, what is that? Yeah, so I think for me, people are the big thing, you know, so it's always been how do we impact people, how do we transform people, how do we support people on their journey, and I think you can do that in anything, um, and whether I'm a speaker, facilitator, or through the business I run, I always have that opportunity to, you know, touch people's lives, whether it's in small or big ways, and I think one of the, the 
I don't know if it's a challenge or one of the, you know, the things around being a speaker is that because you're so much in your content and you have these opportunities where you're constantly working with people around the same content, uh, you can tend to think that people know those. It's like, oh, we talk about this all the time. It's a thing, right? Um, but then there's always that opportunity where you're working with a new business, whether you're coaching a new person and there's those light bulb moments. And you kind of look at your content and you're like, wow, I've known this forever, but there's still people who are like, this is so great. I had no idea that this was my Enneagram profile and that that was how I influenced my decisions and that these are the strengths that I have. And now I can use these to you know, perform better and to show up better. And those light bulb moments for me are everything. You know, it's the content is fine. The presentation is great. Your delivery is whatever it is. But when people just get it, that, those for me are the juicy moments that make it all worth it. So how have you found the transition from because I mean a lot of that interaction you're getting in a live audience and you can see those light bulb moments what challenges have you now found with virtual I mean here we are in the same city but in complete opposite ends of it yeah (laughs) chatting so 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 what what challenges have you found and still to try and get that light bulb moment So what I find very interesting, Duncan, is the fact that people are very open, you know, so I think at first people are like, oh, you know, video, virtual, I don't know, you know what it is. Um, But I found that, you know, sort of in the same way how people overshare on social media sometimes, I think uh, virtual communication is the same thing. And it's so beautiful how people have become comfortable enough with this format to verbally be able to say to you, hey, you know, that that comment or that, that point that you made there it really hit me, you know, or um, in some of the work that we do where people have to complete um, a questionnaire beforehand that produces a profile um, and they, they kind of go, shucks, I was reading through my profile and I had no idea that this was this way. Or for example, you know, I knew I was feeling tired, I knew I was fatigued, but I didn't really know that statistically speaking, that's how bad my um, fatigue was or that's how bad my lack of resilience was. And I, I knew I was feeling it, but until I saw the numbers on the page, it didn't really hit me quite as hard. So I think there's a lot of honest moments that happen in between that, that people are quite open with sharing. Um, and in, in as much as, yes, I definitely miss the live audience and the instant feedback and the instant gratification and the energy of the room. Um, what I really love about this new format is that we can literally be anywhere in the world, right? And I think the world has obviously always been open, but virtual is created the space where it's really just normal, you know? So, I mean, it's only three months into the year and I've done about five different um, international engagements that were just like people going, hey, I saw you on LinkedIn. Do you want to come speak at this uh, free thing we're doing to like engage ladies or to activate this community or to speak on? I mean, so interestingly, I got invited to speak um, and a summit that was hosted by this lady from Canada, but it was um, on how to find your soulmate, you know? And so she, when, she, when she sent me a message on Instagram, she was like, hey, I really like your work and I want to know if you can talk about this. And I never would have thought like I'd be <laughs> invited to be part of a panel of love experts because that's what she called us. Uh, but she really wanted me to speak to like, you know, your personality styles and how that shows up in the way you present yourselves in relationships and so forth. So I think it's beautifully made the world, the world closer. Um, and because it's normal to be virtual, I think a lot of events now will have that aspect where it's like, yes, we have people in the room, but we're definitely dialing in a lot of other speakers and that's going to become a, a, a new thing. And I think that's fantastic. Hmm. So, so for me, I, I completely agree. I think if we, like now, I can't leave the room because you'll see me leave the room. Yeah. <laughs> in, a li- in a live audience, the people at the back can come and go as they want. Yeah. And, and chat so that's yeah, and chatter and sit on their phones. And whereas now, I can't. If I was sitting now on my phone, you'd be going, uh, sorry, I'm talking to you. Yep. So actually, I am engaging with you because I have to look at you. And it feels like you are now talking to me. So even if there were 10 there, I still think that they, you would be talking to me. Yes. And your message would come directly to me. So for some of it, I, I do believe you're right. It is engaging, but we're not getting the energy. And it's yeah. hard to do that. That's why I wear Harry Potter, you see, because then the <laughs> energy can go out. So. Comes through through the T-shirt, yes. definitely. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> um, so, if you had to, if you had to give some advice to someone coming into the speaking industry, what what have you learned since you started doing it? Sure. And okay, you would do so, differently. And what yeah. could you do differently? So definitely key piece of advice, because I have people ask me on social media a lot, oh, I see you speaking, I want to be a speaker, how do I be a speaker? Uh, so I think just that assumption that 
um, you're going to make a million bucks being a speaker. We're not Tony Robbins. Okay, we're not. <laughs> no, one's, no one's paying you a million rand to show up and speak, right? Uh, so I think to, to get rid of those assumptions uh, and to understand that, you know, speaking is really an organization or people putting trust in you and saying, we know that you're good at this topic. We trust you with our audience. We trust you with our staff. We trust you with our, our team. And that's really the rapport that you're wanting to build. So, you know, be prepared to do a lot of free stuff in the beginning. Um, be prepared, especially even if, you're, even if you're an established speaker but are wanting to move into new spaces or establish yourself in different countries, um, be willing to do the free work. You know, so that, that assumption that, you know, I'm going to speak and be a millionaire is, you know, stop. <laughs> um, but so really be prepared to, to do the grind, you know. And I think also be prepared to prepare. You know, speakers, especially really good speakers, make speaking look like something they do, you know, while they're cooking food, which is the quality of a good speaker. But just because it looks so good and very easy for them to do, it doesn't mean that it is. So a lot of work goes into the finesse yeah. and the art of being able to engage an audience and pick something up that somebody's just said and then work it into your talk and stuff. So what looks effortless actually does take work and years of experience. So be prepared to put in that work, but also be um, patient with yourself and building up that skill set and that um, that stage presence, you know, that I think a lot of speakers now have also gone, you know, how do I take my stage presence and put it in a screen? Because that's all I have. Um, and then in terms of things that I would do differently, I don't know if I can say it, you know, I don't, um, I've, I've been a speaker maybe for the past three to five years, but I don't know that I've, I've sort of, you know, explored it to its, its, its lengths that I could say, you know, this is what I would do differently. I haven't reached that point yet. I'm constantly definitely always learning, um, you know, understanding the power of collaboration, understanding, you know, what it means to have, um, to be on the same event speaking list as a different speaker who has um, better expertise or a better profile and, you know, understanding how you can build those relationships and leverage on that and allow those things to move you forward and open doors for you and so forth. Um, but not yet at a stage where I'm like, Looking back on my speaking career, I think this is what I would have done differently. Mm, fair point. So then if you had to look at the tools. So, I mean, speaking, we've always said it's, it's, it's not only the hours you put in, but it's the time. Yes. And you, you're absolutely right. I mean, three to five years. Some would say that's a very young career as a speaker. Yeah. And, but you may have done you know, 10,000 hours yeah. in those five years or 20,000 hours. So it's it's that becomes important, not just also the, the amount of time, it's how much speaking you do. That's um, true. And I think just also on that, being a young speaker as well, you know, because uh, I mean, anyone could be listening to this, but there is also that element of, so I, well, I'm, I'm, I'm 30 this year, so I was 25 and speaking to people, right? And there's like this, what does this 25 year old know about whatever she's here to talk about? So I think also how you're able to sort of build your confidence and how you come across in those kinds of circumstances, but even for yourself to kind of be able to hold your, hold the room or to hold space for yourself to say, yes, I am young in a space where there aren't any young people, or yes, I'm a woman in a space where there aren't any women, um, or yes, I'm, I'm black in a space where there's predominantly a lot of white people, but this is how I'm gonna show up and, and hold my space. And I think just the patience in that as well. And, and, and the, I suppose the kindness and gentleness with yourself as you learn how to navigate those spaces and understand different audiences based on the majority of what that particular demographic is. Mm, definitely. So what tool, so I mean, we're almost done because I said we wouldn't take up too much time, but so what tools would you say have really benefited you? Not only when you started, but maybe, you know, as you've progressed, what, because we all try something. So what tools are helping you to, to benefit your career and speaking? Yes. So practice makes perfect, right? So when people always ask me about speaking, I'm like, go make announcements at church or the place where you volunteer or the clubhouse or whatever. Go put yourself in a space where you have to make announcements, right? And that's that's a place to start because there's no way you're going to be in an auditorium with 2,000 people and think you're going to nail it when an audience of 20 people is like, <sighs> you know? So <laughs> I think that 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 ability to just put yourself out there and and to do and to fail small you know so even with this virtual world organize an event for yourself and even if only five people are as vp host it like it's an actual big thing and you know you're showing up as if there's fifty thousand people um on the stream and deliver it in that way and i think that ability to just um hone in that talent and hone in your skills is very um important and then i think just in terms of technical tools that people use um, finding what works for you, you know, so I think there's 
is simple things around, you know, having the right equipment, I think automatically adds a level of confidence where you're just like, okay, I know my camera's not going to fail me. I know my lighting won't fail me. I know my mic won't fail me. So if you're confident, at least with that. And I think those little things that, you know, help you jump over hurdles are really good to have. Um, and then within your own space is being authentic, right? And I, I can't give a specific tool on how do you identify authentic because it's an individual thing. Um, but I, I, I do believe you will always fail if you're trying to be someone else, you know? So if you show up with an energy and you're trying to emulate someone that you're not or that doesn't resonate with you, I think that's very challenging to keep up, you know? So to always go back to, um, okay, that was a good session. How authentic was I in my delivery? How authentic was I in my content and how I want to be doing this, right? Because I, the, the idea that you're committed to this long term, right? So, um, and, and obviously there's freedom to change, but if this is the tone you're setting, do you want to be this person for the next five, 10, 20 years? Are you comfortable committing to this persona of speaker? And I think it's so much easier to do it when you're authentic to yourself. I don't think I've heard anybody actually summarize that as well as you have. So thank you. I think it's, no, I mean, it's all individual. Everyone has different tools and different things that they use, but you hit most of them on the on the head as a nail. You know, however the saying goes, I think I've, my tongue got a bit tired there. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, so just to summarize, I mean, where, where next? What what are your 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 next adventure? What what are you planning? Tell us. Sure. So where next is here now with um, Hexit Media. So I'm super I'm happy to have joined the team and to be part of the family. I'm excited for this partnership and the wonderful work that you guys are doing behind the scenes um, and what the team is doing to really put together a really fantastic platform that supports speakers, but also people who are wanting to work with speakers, facilitators, MCs and so forth. Um, and then personally, from a business perspective, you know, we've um, we've got the Mentor Magazine and that launched um, on the 8th of March in celebration of International Women's Day. And our theme for the magazine um, was launch and challenge because we wanted to inspire people to finally launch, you know, that start the idea, start the business, get the project going. And in that process to challenge the status quo, you know, challenge what is possible for yourself, what other people think is possible for you, what is typical um, and what's not, and just get out there and do it. You know, so I think we'll continue definitely with that and um, wanting to support and inspire people to do that. Uh, we have a virtual city tour planned to do activations in different cities to you know, get women starting their businesses. Um, and then we have our next issue coming out in June. So at the moment, we just have um, a quarterly publication. It's a free download. So people can get that from www.menther.co.za. And we'll see how that goes um, next year. Uh, but there's, there's definitely plans to perhaps convert that into some kind of a digital interactive platform that creates greater space for our community. Well, we look forward to that. I look forward to getting a copy. Um, as you know, uh, my wife is my partner. So I think empowering women is better for the planet. I think if we had more female presidents, we probably wouldn't have so many wars. Yeah, <laughs> and I people agree. would probably be nicer with each other. So, <laughs> And Siki, I can only say thank you very much for your time. Um, you, I know how busy you've been and how busy we hope to make you. So it's it's a real honor and a pleasure to be working with you. And I've thoroughly enjoyed today. So thank you. Thank very you much. very much.